I'm Lisa Hanairo with the Council of State Governments Midwestern Office. I staff the caucus and I'm managing the logistics for this webinar. Here is the agenda for the hour. In addition to the presentation on key Great Lakes issues to watch in 2015, we'll hear from GLLC Chair Senator Ann Rest from Minnesota about the organization, its members, and about some of the activities that are planned for 2015. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. The slides from the presentation and the recording will be posted on the GLLC website today at the address you see on the screen. The recording will also be available on CSG Midwest's YouTube channel. You'll receive a follow-up message from me with information on where you can access the recording and the slides. To reduce the possibility of feedback or other external noise, the conference will be in listen-only mode. After the presentation, I'll open up the line for questions. If you have a question, please let me know either by typing the question in the GoToWebinar questions pane or by clicking the hand icon to raise your hand. If you accidentally click on the button to raise your hand, just click it again and it'll turn off. Next, a few tips if you do plan to ask a question. If you're using your telephone, please make sure to enter your audio pin, which you'll find in the audio pane. Press pound, then pin. Uh, then pound again. If you selected voice over IP and are using your computer's microphone and speakers, please test your settings by clicking on the test settings link to the audio pane. Press pound, then pin, then pound again. Uh, your connection to the webinar will be muted, so don't worry about anyone hearing you as you test your microphone. If your microphone doesn't appear to be working and you want to be able to speak, you should call in using one of the telephone numbers listed in the audio pane and make sure to enter the PIN. We have toll-free options available for both the U.S. and Canada. And finally, after the webinar, you'll all be asked to take a very brief survey, just three questions. Please take the time to fill out the survey so we can get feedback to help us improve these webinars. Now I'll turn the floor over to the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus Chair, Minnesota Senator Ann Rest. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is our last webinar of 2014, and it is my last one as the GLLC chair. At the end of this month, I'll complete my second two-year term as chair, and I will hand the reins over to the chair-elect, Wisconsin Representative Corey Mason. You'll hear more about our upcoming transition later in the broadcast. But first, I want to provide a brief overview of the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus for those of you who may not be familiar with our organization, and especially for those who are um, uh, newly elected to their uh, legislatures. I hope that after hearing about the caucus, legislators on the line who are not yet members will decide to become active in our organization and encourage others to do the same. The Great Lakes Legislative Caucus is indeed a binational, nonpartisan group of state and provincial lawmakers from the Great Lakes region, with members from the eight U.S. states <clears throat> and the two Canadian provinces. We have three primary goals facilitating the regional exchange of ideas and information on key Great Lakes issues, strengthening the role of state and provincial legislators in the policymaking process, and perhaps most importantly, to promote the restoration and protection of the Great Lakes. I chair the caucus, and my colleague, Michigan State Senator Darwin, Senator Darwin Boer, is the vice chair. As officers, Senator Boer and I lead the GLLC's elected executive committee, which directs the organization's activities. The caucus was organized in 2003 with assistance from the Council of State Government's Midwestern Office. We are very grateful to CSG Midwest for their staff support, in particular um, Lisa, and also to the Joyce Foundation, whose financial support has help the GLLC develop into the premier regional forum for state and provincial legislators who are committed to restoring and protecting the Great Lakes, part of our mission. The caucus works very hard to help its members and indeed all of the region's legislators learn about Great Lakes issues and stay apprised of developments with regard to state, provincial, and federal legislations and 
<clears throat> programs that could affect the lakes. We advocate for the Great Lakes, for example, by giving our members opportunities to sign on to letters on timely topics. In addition to webinars such as this one, the caucus hosts Great, Lake, Great Lakes policy workshops in our state capitals, and we hold annual meetings that rotate throughout the 10 jurisdictions in the basin. We also have a quarterly e-newsletter, Great Lakes News for Legislators, and we maintain state and federal legislative tracker documents, uh, trackers documenting any water-related bills that are introduced. For more information on the caucus, you can visit our website, greatlakeslegislators.org. The site contains information on our past and upcoming events, including webinars. I'm excited that our webinars are now posted on CSG's uh, Midwest New YouTube channel because I think these recordings can be a great resource to our members. The more opportunities we have to publicize them, the more information will benefit legislators in the Great Lakes region. I'm also excited to announce that the caucus is now on Twitter. <clears throat> I hope those of you who use Twitter will follow us at GLL caucus. Finally, I want to remind legislators on the line that if you, again, if you are not a GLLC member, you may enroll by visiting our website or the online enrollment link shown on this slide. There's no cost to become a member, only benefits. Membership is open to all legislators from the eight U.S. states and two Canadian provinces in the Great Lakes region and I encourage you to enroll today. If you're already a member, once again, I encourage you to reach out to your colleagues, particularly those who are near, newly elected, and recommend that they join our organization as well. Now I'll turn to our subject for today, key Great Lakes issues to watch in 2015. Our speaker is Chad Lord. Chad serves as the policy director for the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, where he develops and guides the implementation of the coalition's legislative and policy agenda in Washington, D.C. He also serves as the senior director for water policy at the National Parks Conservation Association, where he focuses on protecting and restoring America's greatest national, natural treasures uh, surrounding national parks. This is Chad's second time speaking on one of our webinars, so I want to welcome him back. I'll also mention that he received his BA from St. Olaf College in Minnesota, where coincidentally uh, my grandson is now a junior. Thank you for joining us again, Chad, and now you have the floor. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I would say umyanya to your grandson. You bet. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll um, I was. I am. Um, it's great to be back um, to talk to you all today. Um, I'm very excited to share with you some of um, our views of what we are expecting to see as key Great Lakes issues to watch for in, in 2015. Um, so I also wanted to thank uh, Lisa for the kind invitation um, to join you and then also to Senator for that nice introduction as well. So let me just see if I'm not technologically uh, sophisticated, so here let me see if I can get this going. So I just wanted to share with folks a little bit about who the Great Lakes Coalition is. Um, we are about 120 non-governmental organizations who came together and 2004 specifically to work on preserving and protecting and restoring the Great Lakes. Since 2004 we've done worked on a number of key issues primarily um, trying to secure adequate um, funding for Great Lakes restoration projects in the basin. I would be remiss if I did not offer special thanks to Peter Weggy and the Weggy Foundation and also the Joyce Foundation who have been long-term um, and committed supporters of the great of our of our coalition. Um, what I hope to do during this presentation is to provide a brief overview of what we saw happen this year. I think it's always good to begin with 
a discussion of what we've been able to accomplish to date, and then to turn my attention to what we are anticipating seeing uh, next year. There are many issues that I am not an expert in, um, so some of the things I will be talking about will be just introductions to the issues themselves. Um, I won't be able to go into much detail, um, but I will try to my best to answer any questions folks have um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so what did we see happen this year? Well, even though people talk about um, the con this Congress being one of the least productive in U.S. history, and based on the numbers, that is definitely true, um, they were able to pass a number of key things that are important to the Great Lakes that I wanted to highlight, because I know there are things that um, are important to the states, um, um, what's going on in each of your states, uh, as well as um, things that are going to be very important to the health of the, of the Great Lakes themselves. I would start with um, just mentioning that the Congress was able to pass a Water Resources Development Act, which does authorize many water resources projects, um, primarily in the Inland Waterway System. Um, those are projects that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers typically leads on. Those would be the projects that deal with dredging, um, locks and dams, those types of, those types of um, issues, as well as ecological and environmental restoration activities um, that are specific to the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes restoration efforts. Um, key to that was, key to the passage of the Water Resources Development Act was some important changes that I know many people in the Great Lakes region had been working hard on. Um, which was changes to the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, ensuring that there was money available in the trust funds to do the important dredging that is necessary to keep Great Lakes harbors open to not only commercial shipping, but also recreational vessels. Uh, appropriations was um, finally enacted for the current fiscal year, fiscal year, federal fiscal year 2015. Um, that bill, as many of you probably saw, was enacted um, at um, on Saturday, well, it was passed by Congress on Saturday, still to be signed by the president. Um, there was a number of important investments made in that bill. The one that we, the coalition tracks, um, is for what is for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has, over the last five years, invested over one and a half billion dollars in the region to undertake over two thousand projects across the basin in each of the eight Great Lakes states. Uh, the, our coalition and many of our coalition partners have been advocating for an additional $300 million for the current fiscal year, and we were successful in securing another $300 million for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for fiscal year 2015, so additional monies that will be available to the region to undertake uh, the uh, cleanup of the areas of concern and the legacy contaminants that are sitting in the sediments, um, habitat restoration projects, uh, invasive species projects, and that sort of thing. Um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Authorization Bill, um, a bill to authorize the program for an additional five years. Um, that legislation did pass the U.S. House of Representatives last week by um, voice vote um, without any opposition. It would authorize the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for an additional five years at $300 million a year. Uh, but, there was, uh, but the Senate was unable to pass the legislation before they adjourned for the year last night. So we'll have to revisit that again next year. Um, important to uh, the agricultural sector um, in the region, um, there was a farm bill that was enacted um, earlier this year. Um, as part of that, I would note was a new program called the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which consolidated a number of conservation programs, including one specific to the Great Lakes um, under the RCPP. Um, the RCPP is an innovative program that um, hopefully will um, attract additional Farm Bill conservation resources into the region to help us address some key water quality issues that um, most, most um, notably um, issues around nutrients, um, either nitrogen or phosphorus, um, getting into the water and creating some of the algae and harmful algal bloom problems that we've been seeing most recently in, in Lake Erie. So that was what was happened this year. So even with uh, a so-called um, 
do nothing Congress, we did accomplish quite a bit. Um, so what are we expecting to see next year? Well, as you all know, and as many of you have to deal with in your own state legislatures, Congress needs to pass both the budget and funding legislation um, every year. Um, and so appropriations will, again, be something to watch for next year um, when the 114th Congress convenes. Again, uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, will be high on the list of priorities for our coalition, and I hope many of our part and many of our partners as well. Funding opportunities for many other um, activities, including dredging and farm bill conservation and other programs, will also um, be part of the appropriations processes as the new Congress begins to um, begins its examination of, of programmatic funding levels and sets funding levels um, for the upcoming fiscal year, which will be 2016, which will start on October 1st next year. Um, many of you, I know, are also concerned about um, uh, different types of policies that um, the current the Obama administration has put forward um, without getting into you know, whether I support or oppose any of those particular policies. Um, many of those policies um, might be addressed through so-called policy riders as part of appropriations bills. So I would just flag that for folks if in case you have a particular interest in a particular policy, that that may be something to watch out for. Um, um, many members may try to address either block or pursue a different type of policy as it relates um, coming out of the administration. Um, most of these policies and most of the action will likely focus on the things that the Environmental Protection Agency has been proposing, either climate change or issues around um, waters of what, what defines a water of the U.S. Um, some th other things to watch out for next year, um, invasive species, obviously a big issue, um, especially around um, in, in Lake Michigan with all the attention that people are paying towards Asian carp. I think we'll continue to see the um, ongoing implementation um, or efforts to implement um, um, different ways of preventing Asian carp from m continuing their migration up the um, Illinois rivers in, uh, towards Lake Michigan. There are a number of proposals that came out early last, or earlier in the year as part of the Great Lakes Mississippi River Inner Basin Feasibility Study um, that the Army Corps had produced. Um, and so now there are ongoing efforts to kind of try and come to consensus around what next, uh, what's next um, in terms of where we go and to prevent Asian carp um, uh, from being in, from getting into in, and establishing themselves into the Great Lakes. Um, also, ballast treatment, I know an ongoing issue um, for many people. Um, ballast water continues to be an, a vector for the introduction of invasive species, although we haven't thankfully seen um, new invasive species introduced into the Great Lakes in a while. Um, that doesn't mean that they aren't either coming in or aren't, aren't, isn't still a threat. Um, there may be efforts to um, address that through, through legislation next year. Um, so it's also something that um, folks may want to, want to be on the lookout for. Why is this important? Um, because some of the legislation potentially could um, preempt state efforts um, to do what states themselves think um, is necessary to, to deal with ballast, ballast, um, ballast regulations. Um, nutrients. Um, I think we all, <laughs> I think we're all pretty aware of what happened in Toledo earlier this year. Um, the consequences of um, runoff from either farm fields or city streets um, are having dramatic consequences. Again, in the Great Lakes, I think the most dramatic are you know, consequence, consequences in Lake Erie for a whole host of reasons, most, some of which is just Lake Erie is the shallowest and warmest and all of the rest. Is, um, but you know, those are definitely consequences that we're seeing. And the consequence in Toledo, I think, was, is a fairly dramatic reminder that we need to continue to take steps to deal with um, these types of runoff issues. Um, there are a lot of investments being made to help farmers, for example, in applying conservation practices to their, to their farm fields. Um, clearly, they're not completely successful yet, um, and so we'll continue to need to look at what more can be done in that area um, to address some of those issues. 
Um, I don't know what Congress may be interested in doing in this area other than continuing to invest in things like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which funds, um, which targets funding into areas uh, like in the Western Lake Erie Basin in Ohio, around Saginaw Bay in Michigan, or Green Bay in Wisconsin. Um, there may be some potential legislation that Congress would try to enact that would look at setting standards for drink, or setting drinking water standards for microcystin and other uh, toxins that are created by these algal blooms. Um, more broad scale um, responses to the al harmful algal problem um, is probably unlikely at this point, um, but it is something that we should that we'll be keeping our eyes out for. Um, Transportation. Um, we already mentioned um, as some, an accomplishment for this year and under the Water Resources Development Act, um, water infrastructure, um, um, those types of things will continue the implementation of that, um, implementation of those um, efforts that are authorized under the Water Resources Development Act um, will continue next year. I know it will draw the focus of many people, especially around issue, um, how the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund gets spent. Um, in, to ensure that Great Lakes harbors, either commercial or recreational harbors, are uh, getting the share of dredging dollars. Um, there are also surface transportation issues, um, highways and public transportation systems. Um, that legislation needs to be reauthorized, as I'm sure most of you are, are paying attention. <laughs> most people um, uh, know what, uh, are very familiar with surface transportation because we all drive cars down highways. And, um, uh, so that will be something that Congress will also need to, to deal with, the reauthorization of that. Um, beyond the transportation infrastructure, um, there's also the infrastructure around um, water, so sewage in particular, sewage infrastructure, and then now um, the focus on drinking water infrastructure will also likely be something that um, could, be, um, could come up next year and something that people would need to, to pay attention to. So things like the state revolving fund, not just making sure that the state revolving funds have money in them to get into the pipelines in the states, but also making sure that they have um, that some of the some of the issues around alternative funding sources um, can also be considered. Um, I put down energy development and climate change. You know, those are things that I know folks had um, highlighted. Um, energy development, in particular, there are some pipeline issues that I know some of our members are, are focusing on. Um, in Michigan in particular, and a pipeline under the Mackinac Straits. Um, there are also some, some energy transportation issues that I know some of um, the coalition, my coalition members have been focused on in Minnesota, up in the Duluth area, um, in terms of transporting some of the oil and natural gas. Um, so there's some transportation or energy transportation issues that may pop up. I don't, necess I don't know or think that they will rise to the federal level, at least the congressional level. Um, in terms of legislation, although there may be some opportunities or areas that people would want to pay attention to as it relates to the federal agencies. Um, so those would be some, some things to potentially, some, some key issues to potentially watch out for next year. I would note that everything that I've talked about to date are, um, has been focused on Congress. I haven't really spent any time on the administration administrative side, um, the rules and regulations that, that the Obama administration may be pursuing. Um, many of those rules have already been promulgated, or at least proposed rules have been promulgated. Um, issues around, as I already no mentioned earlier, around how to define what is a water of the United States under the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act is something that I know has drawn much attention. There's also a lot of attention being paid to some of the climate change regulations that the administration has pursued. Um, so there are those administrative proposals that also um, are things that um, if, if you have interest in those areas that would definitely be key issues to watch out for, um, to watch out for next year. Um, then, so those are some of the issues. I just also would pro provide a little bit of kind of perspective on, you know, the pathway that those issues may take in, in Congress. Obviously, we're, having, we're going to see a new Congress, which will be sworn in um, early January of next year. The 114th Congress will come in. The first session will begin January 3rd. Um, and there will be a whole group of new congressional members that um, will be taking their oaths 
for the first time here in Washington. Um, the dynamics, the, the broader political dynamics, um, uh, you know, aren't changing in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, there are a number of new representatives um, that I think will be um, that will be coming to Washington, that, and most of which are known to us. Um, pro you probably all know who they are, but at least for me um, here in Washington, we ha I have yet to to meet these folks, and so we're looking forward to um, introducing them to our work and. Um, beginning to build relationships with them and hopefully um, having them join our efforts here in Washington um, to get them to be Great Lakes supporters. Um, so at least in the U.S. House of Representatives, the dynamics are, don't, are, aren't going to necessarily change dramatically then from, from the, the broader political dynamics that we saw play out this year. Where I think we'll see most of the change will be in the Senate. Obviously, the Senate is changing. Con the Senate control is changing from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. How that shakes out in terms of some of the uh, issues that um, I highlighted is, is, any, is still an open question. I mean, and whether or not the Senate actually will be a more functional body is still also an open question. Um, we'll have to wait and see. I would note that um, we did see one change to the Senate delegation with the election of Gary Peters, who's taking over for um, Senator Carl Levin, a longtime Great Lakes champion. Um, that was the only change that, um, in the Senate delegation. And so we don't anticipate, at least in the, in the Great Lakes Senate delegation, um, there to be much change or support for the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes um, issues um, that we've been talking about today. Um, but obviously next year is a new year, and, and time will tell on how all these things play out. Um, so again, that's who I am, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions that people may have, um, or if people think I missed something completely and want to put something on our on our radar. I would be I would love to know that or hear that too. Um, with that, I guess I'll just open it up to any questions. Okay, if anybody has any questions, please either click on the hand icon to indicate that uh, you want to speak, and I'll unmute your line, or else you can type your question in the questions panel. And Senator Rest, I muted you. Sorry. So if you have a question, you can go ahead now. Your, your line's open. <clears throat> well, I, um, I was curious about your comments on um, the uh, concerns about um, pipelines and um, particularly the impact on the maybe the Great Lakes states of um, uh, not only the fuel that's coming from um, the Bakken, but if there's been discussion among your groups about the impact of the uh, lowering of the prices of uh, crude oil and if that's going to have um, any impact or what kind of impact. I think it will have an impact, but what kind of impact it may have on um, the, um, uh, the Great Lakes states and their economic activity. And yeah, I think, well, a couple of, that's a, that's a, that's a big question um, and multifaceted. I think starting with kind of the ecological side of things, yes, many of our groups um, have been focused on um, energy, transportation. Um, our Minnesota groups, in particular, are, are interested in the transportation um, of Bakken oil um, to the Duluth Superior area and then put on barges and shipped to be processed and refined. Um, so there are just issues around what that looks like, if the increase of that type of transportation, what happens if there's an accident, what that means for uh, an ecosystem like Lake Superior, um, which is fairly isolated and, generally speaking, deep, cold um, mm -hmm. source of fresh water, drinking water for a lot of people. Um, so, there are, so there are ongoing conversations about that, I know, um, in term, uh, up in that part of the area. I know there are also conversations in, of, about pipelines, and the, what I'm most familiar with are pipelines in Michigan. There is a 60-year-old pipeline that runs under the Mackinac Straits that people are concerned about, given that mm -hmm. there are proposals to try and pump more oil through through that pipeline and what that means in terms of a potential catastrophic leak in the Straits of Straits of Mackinac. Um, 
And so there are just definitely issues around the ecological um, uh, consequences of, um, of increased transportation of, of oil or natural gas or other energy resources um, through, through the existing infrastructure um, and what steps need to be taken to ensure that you know, we're, we're able to respond quickly if, if the decision is made to allow for um, those types of resources to be moved um, through, through the Great Lakes system. Um, in terms of pricing, yeah, I mean, I think, well, I mean, there's a couple of things, um, observations, and I mean, uh, as a caveat, I'm, I, I don't study economics. Um, I'm, I'm a political scientist, not an economist, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think you're right to point out that, you know, with an increase in production and oil prices, that's definitely good for the regional economy, manufacturing, um, definitely benefits from um, lower oil prices, um, and, you know, people in this, everyone who, drives a car benefits from more gas prices. Um, hopefully people are going to benefit from more natural gas prices in order to heat their homes and hopefully that gives people more money in their pockets and therefore can spend more and help drive the U.S. economy. So there's definitely a, a, an economic benefit towards But it um, also might, it might uh, lead to a reduction in production too in North Dakota. I, that's, oh. that's what I'm reading. So it, it's kind of a double-edged sword that uh, it, the oil might be getting uh, too too cheap to um, be worth the um, right. the uh, the cost of um, transporting the oil, whether it's by rail or through some pipeline, and there, that the that the uh, uh, activity to promote pipelines, um, actually, and this is a little bit off, but it actually including Keystone might be less intense um, until the price of oil stabilizes. Right. No, there's definitely that. That is definitely true. The economics of production and, and um, areas that are more costly to um, to pull the, the stuff out of the ground mm -hmm. is is definitely offset when the prices are low. I mean, it's just it costs a lot to produce, and you don't get any exactly. anything back from it. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it's just basic supply and demand, right? So I just think the Great Lakes states we need to keep our eyes open on all of that too, uh, because of the impacts, uh, both positive and challenging, right. to um, to our um, our states' economies. Yeah, I would note that if, uh, I, I there may be more opposition in in some of the Minnesota groups of some of the work or some of the proposals to move energy through there, although I haven't really picked up, at least from members of our coalition, of a, a complete, absolute no transportation, um, no pipelines, no, mm -hmm. I think, as you pointed out, the groups I know that I've been working with, I've been hearing from, are kind of, a, we just want to look at all sides and ensure that we're taking the appropriate precautionary steps in order to protect the, protect the resource, given the variability of of the energy sector. Right. This is Lisa. We have another question, just sort of a clarification. Um, Chad, can you discuss the significance of congressional authorization of the GLRI versus the way it has received uh, funding so far? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, the significance, in our opinion, of authorizing the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is that it sets it a little bit firmer in stone um, rather than basically authorizing the program on a year-by-year -year basis through the appropriations process you create a, a firmer legislative framework that is a little bit harder to um, monkey with in case you know as the Congress itself changes or the white well the administration will change in a, in a couple of years so I think from our perspective it's just, it does set um, kind of the parameters a little bit more firmly and, and puts it more firmly in place um, through this through the passage of, of authoriz authorizing legislation. Um, it also takes it out of the hands of the appropriators and puts it back into the responsibility of the authorizers who can also provide a little bit more adequate oversight. Um, our coalition generally feels that the implementation of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has been pr very very successful, barring you know some stuff around the edges. You know, obviously there's going to be decisions made that not everyone's going to be wild about. But in general, we think that um, the implementation of the GLRI has been has been pretty successful, and that they've been able to 
the federal agencies in particular have worked closely in partnership with the state agencies, with our NGOs and others to really put together a pretty effective, um, pretty effective way of implementing um, the distribution of a lot of a lot of money in a short period of time. Um, so, but that's just but so but that still needs to have oversight. Um, we still need we would like to see proper oversight given um, at the congressional level to ensure that um, the monies are going to to the where to the to the highest priority areas um, areas like areas of concern. So whether or not that would be um, an area of concern in Milwaukee or Duluth or you know outside of Detroit or you know wherever wherever you may be to continue to focus on cleaning those areas up or the monies that are going towards trying to prevent the spread of Asian carp or other invasive species or um, for us also the investments um, that are going towards um, conservation activities on, on agricultural lands to help prevent the runoff of of nitrogen and phosphorus so um, so yeah, that's 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 why we think it's important that it gets authorized. We'll continue to be working on that next year, um, and hopefully we'll we'll be able we'll, have, well we'll obviously have more time in the 114th Congress. We'll have two more years to work on it, and hopefully we'll be able to to shake something loose. Great, thank you for that clarification. And does anybody else? Yep, I, oh, go ahead, Senator Russ. Well, I have an I have another question. If um, if someone else is not um, raise their hand, Lisa. Uh, no hands are raised, so go right ahead, please. Okay. Um, uh, this um, this summer, to, um, in Minnesota, we celebrated uh, removing one of the beneficial use impairments to our AOC at the um, up in the St. Louis estuary, and um, I was wondering if. Um, if you could give us some sort of overview of what kind of progress is being made in um, uh, notable progress has been made is being made in other AOCs around the, the basin that you're aware of. There has been a tremendous amount of progress, um, not only in Duluth Superior, and that was a tremendous thing. We were just so pleased to see that activity, and I think just as a side note, the organization up there has has been really amazing to, to watch in terms of pulling the community together on a, on a plan to try and get that Duluth Superior AOC delisted by 2025. Um, mm -hmm. but, but it's not just, the work isn't just going on in Duluth Superior, there's been a lot of tremendous work going on across the basin. Waukegan, um, Illinois AOC I think is on the, uh, has potentially can, is on the list now of um, the wait and see list, um, basically, to see kind of whether or not the cleanup activities there um, are going to be effective, and that they may be able to move that to delisting. Um, Ashtabula in Ohio also is kind of on the wait and see list, and um, waiting. You know, all all of the management activities completed. Um, they, a lot of that is because of the investments that the GLRI has made over the past few years, which has allowed for the increased dredging and the habitat work and the other activities around these AOCs. Um, there was two AOCs that were just delisted a month or so ago in Michigan. Um, let's see, White Lake and I think Muskegon. I'm probably not I'm getting that maybe confused, but there were two that were actually delisted. Um, wow. And that was the third AOC so that's delisted. What, I was going to say uh, that must be the third because there was one in uh, Pennsylvania, Erie, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Presque yeah, Isle was right. delisted last year. There have right. been four delisted total, um, Oswego in New York, um, then followed by Presque Isle last year, and then the two this year. The three most recent, the one in Pennsylvania and the two in Michigan, um, well, the one in Pennsylvania was already kind of a, uh, on, on its way, but the two in Michigan were really, that was, there was, that was really kind of pushed forward because of the GLRI and the a other activity in, in AOCs in like Sheboygan, Wisconsin, or Ashtabula, as already mentioned, in Illinois, um, those, those, that work was definitely the result of the investments being made by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. I would say that there have been more beneficial use impairments delisted um, because of the GLRI's investments in the past four to five years. Um, I think there was something like four times as many in the past four to five years than there had been since the AOCs were established in 1987. 
So that gives you a bit of a sense as to just how much work has been accomplished because of because of the investments made. Well, we certainly were um, uh, were just delighted with the uh, the work done in the St. Louis estuary and the support not only from the Minnesota uh, Pollution Control Agency but also from uh, Wisconsin because, of course. It, it is a uh, Duluth Superior, so it's both cities there that, and both state governments that are uh, involved in supporting the uh, those <clears throat> those efforts um, at the, at that particular AOC. I don't know that there are others that are uh, that call on the cooperation of two states, but um, certainly that's been that's been. Um, a, uh, a real kind of shining star for us uh, in what's happening up in the Duluth area. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who lives in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, I, I can attest to the level of effort it took to get the work done in Sheboygan. It was a 24-7 operation for months at a time, and it was really quite quite um, an industrial activity down by, the, uh, down by the lake on the Sheboygan River. Um, we do have another question. Does the coalition have concerns or recommendations regarding microplastics in Great Lakes waters? Um, our coalition has not taken a position on microplastics. That's not to, that's just for, I mean, the, the, the honest reason is just we haven't had probably time. I mean, we've been really focused on Great Lakes restoration. We do acknowledge that microplastics are a problem and that many of our member organizations are working on this as an issue um, and that they are working with um, states um, and localities to try and phase out microplastics. Um, so the coalition itself has not taken an official position, but many of our member organizations are working, um, working on the issue and trying to see if we can't find other alternatives um, to be used instead. Um, to be able to get some of these some of these little plastic beads out of out of the water. Okay, thank you for that answer. I don't see any other questions, um, so I think we'll move on, Senator Rust. Just okay. I, just, I'm, I have one. Just, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my job as an advocate if I wasn't asking you all to join us in advocating. And I wanted to just provide a couple of quick ideas um, for you all, um, which I'm sure are already at top of mind, but just things that would I know would help us in our efforts. You know, if you have an opportunity to pass resolutions next year in support of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, that would be a great sign, um, I think, for the federal, to the Congress to show that the state legislatures are um, equally invested in, in these efforts. So that would be incredibly helpful. I would invite all of you to attend and visit some of these Great Lakes Restoration Initiative projects. Um, I hope you have been able to do that already, as Senator Rust mentioned the one in Duluth, but it, I would encourage you to go and see these things because there are there's a tremendous amount of work going on in each of your states that is, and you know, I, I can be served, make you, that should make you all very proud. Um, and then obviously, you know, I would encourage you all to support state match um, for the federal <laughs> programs that are going towards towards these, um, these investments. Um, the federal government is investing a lot of its own money, but obviously it gets matched with, with state investments. And I know many states are, are, are bringing forward that match, and that's a, I just would encourage you all to keep that in mind and um, to help us continue with, with our efforts. So sorry, Senator Rest, I, I didn't to interrupt, but I, just, I couldn't not um, offer that to you. That's quite all right. We, um, we appreciate your enthusiasm. and. Um, and it's matched by by ours, uh, and uh, I think you will see. We have um, uh, sent, uh, as I mentioned earlier, letters on to Congress or to the administrator uh, for uh, with regard to um, the mission of the restoration of the of the Great Lakes, whether it's the GLRI or or other or other issues. But um, we're certainly um, we're, we're certainly proud to be part of the uh, of the overall effort by all of the organizations who who um, work to have um, uh, to clean up the Great Lakes and to make sure that they remain economically uh, viable and um, and keep all of our <clears throat> our water uh, uh, 
fit to drink and fish in. And some people think in Minnesota that clean water is better. Why is it important? And in Minnesota, the first reason is to fish in. So, <laughs> so, so whatever it takes. But we do thank you, um, Chad, for a very informative uh, presentation. And um, we, um, uh, at this point, I would like to uh, take a moment to acknowledge um, uh, with our organizational structure, the members of the caucus's executive committee, who along with Senator Boer and I direct the caucus's activities. Three of the current executive committee members will complete their two-year terms of office at the end of this uh, month. Those members are Indiana Senator uh, Joe Zakas, uh, Michigan Senator Bruce Caswell, and New York Senator George Maziars. On behalf of the caucus, I thank all three of them for their service to the caucus over the past two years. Senators Caswell and Maziars are uh, retiring from, from their legislative service as well, and I wish them well and thank them for their service to their constituents and their states. Senator Zakas will continue to be a member of the caucus in 2015 and for many years beyond that, I hope. Of course, if three members are stepping down, that means that several current members will continue to serve in 2015 and 2016. I want to thank all of them for their past service and for their ongoing dedication to the caucus and to the Great Lakes. And I now have the pleasure of introducing the caucus's new leadership team, uh, who will take office on January 1st. First, Succeeding me as the caucus chair will be Wisconsin Representative Corey Mason. Serving with Representative Mason will again be Senator Boer, continuing his role as vice chair. Representative Mason and Senator Boer will lead the caucus's uh, executive committee in 2015 and 2016. The other members of the executive committee are showing on the screen now. We have one representative for each of the 10 jurisdictions in the Great Lakes Basin. And as past chair, I'm delighted to be able to continue to serve on the executive committee um, as a member according to our bylaws. I particularly want to welcome new members, Indiana Senator Ed Charbonneau, Michigan Representative Bruce Rendon, New York Senator Joseph Robach, and Wisconsin Representative Nick Milroy. And now I'll turn the floor over to Representative Mason, who um, will say a few words about um, his, uh, his vision and hopes for the caucus in the coming years. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for all of your hard work, Senator. And uh, if we could do a, a virtual applause for, for the work that you've done, um, I, I think that would be in order right now. I think well, You're uh, more than welcome. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I, I think for me, um, I, I feel like I have big shoes to fill here. I think our organization's been been well served by your stewardship, and um, I, you know, I, I don't think uh, there's anything you have to do to reinvent the wheel here. I think we've got a great organization um, with a great mission, and uh, people continue to care about it. And uh, whether it's you know the areas of concerns or the information we've learned about microbeads or the biological concerns or the, the chemical concerns or the uh, water level concerns, we will continue to, to keep an eye on these issues and uh, work collaboratively um, to get this work done. Um, so I, I continue to believe that this is one of the most important regional organizations that exists to advocate for the Great Lakes and um, really hope that my stewardship and tenure matches uh, the work that's been done previously. And uh, the other thing I would just say to the members of the caucus that are on the line, if, if people have ideas or suggestions or things that they think that I ought to know about, uh, I have a, a, you know, an open invitation to have those communications and um, look forward to working with Lisa and the other staff at CSG to continue to make this a, a great and effective organization. Well, thank you, Representative uh, Mason, and um, I certainly look forward to uh, continuing my interest and activity within the um, 
within the caucus. It's um, it's been a great decade for for um, the Great Lakes, and um, it's wonderful to see so much progress being made in uh, toward delisting the um, the AOCs and the support that not only the federal government but the state governments have been giving to um, to the efforts to um, to fulfill what we see as as our mission. Um, I want to conclude by talking about um, 2015 uh, very briefly. And in uh, next year, there will be a lot of opportunities for legislators and staff to take part in the caucus activities. Uh, in particular, I want to make sure that people know about our annual meeting, which is going to be September 25th and 26th, uh, Friday and Saturday. And I'm very pleased to announce that we are going to be in Buffalo, New York this year, which means that we will have held an annual meeting in each of the 10 jurisdictions in the Great Lakes region. Uh, registration for the meeting will open up in the spring, and we hope once again to be able to offer travel scholarships to caucus members who need them. Uh, looking much farther ahead to 2016, we'll be returning to the site of our very first meeting, and that is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we were brought together by Senator Patty Burkholst of, um, of Michigan. The 2016 annual meeting will take place on July 15th and 16th in conjunction with the annual meeting of the Midwest uh, Legislative Conference of uh, CSG. And in addition to the annual meeting next year, we'll be hosting the Great Lakes Policy Workshops in at least three jurisdictions, including Ohio and Wisconsin. These workshops are part of <clears throat> CSG's, quote, under the dome, uh, unquote, uh, initiative to bring programming to state capitals and they'll be customized to address issues of particular concern to the hosting jurisdictions. Details on these events will be available in early 2015. And of course, we'll continue to host webinars in 2015, starting with the next one on February 18th on the impact of nutrient runoff on Great Lakes water quality. And of course, that was part of uh, Chad's presentation today as well. Registration for the webinar will open soon, so please watch your uh, inboxes for the um, announcement. And then um, over to you, Lisa, to close out the webinar. Thank you, Senator Rest. And I would like to add my own heartfelt thanks to you for your leadership of the caucus and your tireless advocacy for the organization and also for the Great Lakes. Uh, you really have made my transition to staffing the caucus an easy one, and I'm very excited to be able to carry on many of the things you've put in place for the organization. So on behalf of the CSG Midwest staff, thank you very much for all you've done and will continue to do uh, for the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus. And with that, I'll thank our speaker and all our participants today. Uh, you can view any of our webinars at any time by visiting the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus website or visiting CSG Midwest's YouTube channel at the address you see on the screen. I'll also put these links in the email messages that you'll all receive in follow-up to this webinar. To learn about upcoming caucus events, please visit our website or follow us on Twitter. Um, and remember to please take a minute to fill out the very short survey that will pop up as soon as we're done. I hope you'll join us in 2015 for more webinars and that you'll let your colleagues know about this helpful resource for staying up to date on issues that affect the Great Lakes. This concludes our webinar. Best wishes to all of you for a safe and joyous holiday season.